Monkey is swallowing. Snake says swallowing. Next, a swallow too will fly and come and swallow. You ever swallow in a hollow galo, making a whole lot of halabalu. Jale galu, we know say you drop the money from, so give me the loot. Do you really want a revolution or just your turn? And I have with me here Mukomawa Ngugi, who is an associate professor and he's also the author of the book We the Scarred. We'll be having a book chat on the book where we get to liars and know what was in the mind of the writer when he was writing the book. Join me in welcoming Mukomawa Ngugi. Nice to meet you, Mukomawa. Well, nice to meet you as well. Yeah. And, and, and also congratulations on the good work you're doing with, uh, with Sin City. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I know you helped us during our last anthology. And for that, I say thank you again. It's nice meeting you. Hello. All right, um, let's go straight into the book. Uh, I finished the book. I got the book. The book was delivered to me, and I finished the book sometime this morning because I wanted to serve each page as it came. And when I finished it, there was a quote that came to me. That quote was from Wilson Share, and it says, uh, No one leaves home except home is the mouth of the shark. And when I was reading the book, I could see that quote resonating, coming back to me even in the characters, Kalumba, where he had to leave home, go on an exile, and then come back, things were happening. So the question I think we should start with is, why do you think it's important for people who are in diaspora or people who are in exile to remember their history, even if that history didn't treat them right? Because we start the book with uh, Kalumba running away from something of which some of his uh, local people, some of his brothers, so to speak, were also part of some of the things that we're pursuing him. So why do you think it's important for people who are in exile, people who uh, who their countrymen have done bad to, people who colonizers have done bad to, why do you think it's important that they remember their history, even when they're no longer in their countries? I mean, part of it, I mean, part of it, you could just look at the history of, let's say, the African National Congress, right? where the ANC, Mandela's ANC, where a lot of um, where a lot of where a lot of the members were exiled, you know, in, in African countries, for example, Tanzania, uh, Canada, the US, and part of what they would do in exile is conscientizing. That's the term they would use: conscientizing uh, the people with whom or the people who have welcomed into into exile, right? So, in in, in the case of a person like Kalumba in the US, it's important to remember the history of Kenya or in this case, Quartier Republic. Uh, and then and, 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 and the role the US, for example, has played in destabilizing Quartier, because there's always that irony of, you know, most of us, you know, end up or immigrate to countries that are in the West, that are part of the problems that cause people to live in the first place. So if, if, if you're an economic immigrant, for example, part of it could be you're living because of, you know, because of the trade deals, you know, your government has made. But anyway, but yeah, but it's important to remember the history because then you can use it to educate the people who have welcomed you into in, in, in exile. Um, you know, at the same time, um, part of it is also practical, right? You know, um, you know that um, you know you you, you get exiled. Um, you you have families where you are, right? And you need to keep that connection. Uh, in this case, for your children as well. Okay, um, great. You know, I wanted to ask you because everybody knows, uh, would I let me use everybody, use the word, everybody knows your father and everybody knows some of the struggles they went through during their own time and you being in the US as well. Would you say that everybody who, who was exiled or everybody who ran away from home due to dictatorship or imperialism, do you think all their stories are similar? Because you know there are some people. If if you look at the book, if you read the book very well, you see two people who are revolutionaries. We see Ogum, who is doing his own sort of revolution, and we see Kalumba, who is doing another sort of revolution. Both of them are revolutionaries, but one is fighting actively, and the other person prefers uh, dialogue. The other person prefers negotiations. Do you think uh, one part is more important than the other? Uh, which which part is greater? those who are exiled, do you think they fight more 
or they are worth more in the eyes of the people than those who stay back to negotiate? I mean, that's a, that's a really good and tough question. Um, you know, because the ideal would be a symbiotic, right? A symbiotic relationship, right? You know, so where well, the people who are in exile, you know, and this is another thing that the ANC would do, uh, those in exile would also raise funds, right? Would raise funds, you know, for, you know, for, for the ANC on the ground. Um, so the ideal would be for it to be symbiotic, but, um, but, 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 but in the same way now we see there's a divide, you know, of, uh, of, you know, continental Africans, if you want to put it that way, right? You know, Africans who are on the continent and Africans who are in the diaspora. In the same way, we're seeing that growing divide, uh, even, even amongst writers for that matter, right? You know, there's a, a growing divide between writers uh, based in the, in the U.S. and so on and so forth and writers based on the continent. Uh, so that, that's also true of liberation politics. But, but with Kalumba and Ugom, it's, it's also ideological, right? I think Kalumba is more of a, of a purist, right? Of a purist, you know, in other words, for him, he still believes in, in, in a pure revolution, right? And maybe that's part of it, that's, that can, that's his fatal flaw, right? Um, where else Ogum, Ogum is ready to negotiate and, uh, and play practical politics. But historically though, those who play practical politics, for example, in, in a situation like in Kenya, and I'm thinking of Jomo Kenyatta, for, the, you know, for example, um, ended up betraying the revolution, right? You know, so there's always that interesting uh, divide between the ideological uh, purists and those who want to practice pragmatic politics. And you can you can make the same example of, of South Africa. When I was writing the book, I, I, I should mention it, when I was in college, um, I had two good friends who are ANC exiles, right? Uh, and actually they sort of played the same sort of politics. You know, one was more radical than the other one. But at any rate, we are very good friends. And, um, and I learned a lot about the ANC from them. So in a way, in a way, Ugum and um, and Kalumba are personifications of, 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 of these two friends of mine. Okay, um, that's great. I think one is not greater than the other. You use the, the perfect word to um, identify both of them, to categorize both of them, saying they are symbiotic relationship. One person has to be hot. One person mm -hmm. has to uh, be cool just to balance up uh, the struggle. Another thing that fascinated me about the book uh, was the character Mrs. Shaw. You know, how she met Kalumba in the bar. We see this older white woman who who was part, in some way, part of the struggle, who had to move back to Qatar Republic with her husband, of course, move later. But there was one quote she said uh, that really struck me when she was speaking to Kalumba. She, and she said, what does it matter that women are not written in history to have partaken in such... Uh, uh historical events like this and we see her not to give any spoilers we see what she did to her husband and on a normal day women who take that stand against uh racism against injustice against dictatorship despite the fact that they do it to someone who is of the same skin color with them those people get some sort of recognition mm. i think the question i want to ask is why do you think in history women are mostly erased despite the roles they play in historical events like this? Yeah, so um, I, I, I'm thinking of so many things right now, but let me begin just by talking about uh, Elaine Brown, right? So Elaine Brown was the uh, chair, uh, chairperson of the Black Panthers, right? The, the only woman to lead the Black Panthers. And um, in, her book, uh, in, her, in, in her book called, um, I think it's called A Question of Power or along those lines, right? Um, she talks about how she realized the Black Panthers were masculinist. In fact, she says, that, quote unquote, that she realized the Black Panther was a man, right? Meaning that that the patriarchy itself was so ingrained in the in the movement that in spite of having a woman a woman at the at the, at the helm, she still couldn't couldn't change that culture, right? Um, you know, and, and so part of it is that liberation movements have been very patriarchal, you know. So with the with the Black Panthers. The argument of, of the black nationalists was okay. Why don't we first fight for freedom for black people? Why don't we first fight as black people, uh, and then we can get women rights? You know, then black women can fight second, right? Instead of seeing it as the term now people are using is, is uh, intersectional, right? But, be, but but in the seventies and eighties, and I prefer this other term, uh, the interconnectedness of struggle. Like, there's something very abstract about inter, inter, the term intersectional. Uh, yeah, but the idea of um, of, yeah, of, of solidarities, 
you know, across across gender, class, and so on and so forth, the interconnectedness of struggle. So that's one. Um, the other one is that um, that it, much of our history isn't known anyway, right? So, so, so not only do you have a masculinist uh, revolutionary movement, but then when it comes to the writing of that history, even that masculinist uh, revolutionary re revolution gets written out of history. For example, uh, let me go back to Kenya, right? Uh, so in Kenya, we know there were women who were involved uh, in the uh, in the Kenya Land and Freedom Army, right? There is a uh, they, they are, some of them are still living. There is one uh, who is called General Modoni, right? And I don't think most Kenyans know about General Modoni, right? She lives in poverty. Uh, in fact, there was a Mail and Guardian article about her where she was complaining that the only people who come to see her uh, are white anthropology students, right? In other words, the Maumau history in Kenya itself has been erased, and along that, then. Uh, women's contributions get gets erased but i think you know but but i think today maybe that is changing a little bit right you know so you know i think a person like angela davis is well known um not to say that her contribution to the struggle is fully acknowledged by everybody who comes across her uh but i would say at least amongst academics there's a a, a change in consciousness that we shouldn't be writing women out of our out of our histories out of our stories Great. I like that answer. And I hope to see, you know, more women participation, people who not just right now coming to Africa to, you know, for the photo ops and all, people actually digging into their histories to see what mm -hmm. women, the role women have played in some of these historical events. Which leads me to my next question about uh, mental health. Uh, there's something when uh, Kalumba was right, well, was in exile writing in his diary, he, you made us see some of the effects of these revolutions on people's mental health, you know, and that's one thing that has not really been explored. I know that when during my undergraduate days, when I wrote about the Biafran war over here in Nigeria, I had to explore uh, the effects of mental health, effects of the war on women, effect, you know, mental health problems and all. Why do you think it was important to show us um, Kalumba's uh, state, per se, the state in his head, his mental, why do you think that was important? Yeah, so I, I do think we tend to, as you mentioned, actually, we, to, we tend to idealize revolutionaries, right? Uh, you know, and yeah, we, we want to see them, again, actually, we're going back to the idea of masculinity, right? We want to see them as strong, uh, as, um, you know, as principled, uh, you know, people made out of, I don't know, Teflon, right? You know, things that, that, that would just bounce off them. But the reality of, of revol revolutions is, is actually, it's very, very messy, right? And Kalumba definitely has PTSD because when he was uh, when he was in Kenya, um, you know, I, I, and maybe we should talk about why I keep saying Kenya, right, <laughs> instead of <Kwanza. laughs> But um, you know, because I mean, he was tortured, right? You know, so he's he really is a tortured um, exile guy, you know. But with Kalumba, I was also thinking of um, of Franz Fanon's Wretched of the Earth, right? In, in in, in, in the Wretched of the Earth, towards the end, he has this, a chapter on, because, uh, you know, Fernando was a psychiatrist before, you know, you know, before he joined the FLN, the Algerian Revolutionary Movement. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, so he has a small section where he details uh, working with uh, people who have been tortured, in this case, by the French, by the French intelligence police. Um, and there is one where he, he says that, um, and, 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 and revolutions also affect both the colonizer in this case and the colonized, right? Uh, the violence, you know, because at some point he details uh, this French officer who came to him, you know, and said that um, he's having trouble sleeping, you know, he's beating up his family, um, but um, he loves his job. He was a torturer, right? <laughs> so you're saying he loves torturing, you know, but uh, but he, could Fanon make him feel better, right? And then uh, then at some other point, then he'd have. Um, members of, of the FLN who have been tortured then come to his office, right? So, so, so he was able to detail this PTSD very, very well. And in fact, for him, the reason why he ended up joining the FLN uh, or leaving psychiatry to join and become a spokesman for the FLN is that he says he realized that he was treating the symptoms, in this case, the mental symptoms of, of something that has a very concrete material base, and, this, and that was colonialism. So he figured that the best contribution he could make as a psychiatrist actually uh, was ending or or at least helping end colonialism, then you didn't have these sort of mental, mental issues. Yeah, but you're right. And you know, for example, we've never talked about, um, you know, Mandela was in jail for 27 years, right? And I've never read anything. Uh, I'm sure maybe somebody has written about it. 
but I've never read anything about his mental health. Like what, what, yeah, like how did that affect him? How did 27 years of, you know, of tortured, a tortured existence in a cell, how did it affect him? I think someone should, someone should work on that because when he came out and the first decision he, he made, you know, in his personal life was to put away Winnie, put away in quotes now. Mm. It was, I was like, ah, this guy, this guy has been here. You know, he, he, when, I, when I go back to that, I know people see Mandela as a hero, but there's a part of me that has not forgiven him for coming out and discarding, in quote now, discarding the woman. So I think it's something we should look into, how those things affect yeah. people and their decisions when they come out. Yeah, and, and, and actually, Winnie, Winnie is a good example of, uh, of women getting erased out of history, right? You know, so for her, she didn't exactly get erased, but uh, she was, which is a form of erasure, right? You know, she was maligned, right? She was sidelined and maligned. Um, but for me, the most telling case was, I was in Ghana last year, um, you know, and I visited the WB Du Bois Center, right? Uh, du, and everybody knows Du Bois, double consciousness, and so on and so forth. Yeah. But nobody talks about Shirley Du Bois, his wife, right? Who, who it turns out was actually more radical and more more internationalist than Du Bois. Wow. So maybe going back to the earlier point, by by us not learning about the contributions of women uh, in our struggles, then we are then we are not getting the full history, right? We're not getting the full history of, you know. And if we are not getting the full history, then how can we work on the present? If yeah. Exactly. Well said. And speaking of uh, families and loss, you know, in the book, you you made us understand that revolutionaries lose a lot, not only in their love. We see Kalumba losing the love of his life, which is Sukena. We see mm -hmm. uh, his father losing a son. We see Ogum losing a brother. We mm -hmm. see a Qatar Republic losing a beloved patriot. So there was a lot of loss in different forms in the book but i want to ask you personally what does loss mean to you and mm -hmm. what what kind of loss were you trying to pass you know towards the readers through the book yeah that's a really good question that goes to the heart of the book actually um you know so i mean part, part of it is and when you when you look at kalumba you can see there's some not necessarily biographical elements but certainly um that i'm, I'm using Part of my own experiences right you know so part of it where well, well, yeah that my father eventually was exiled right first he was uh, he was put in detention yeah. in uh, 1977 by the kenyatta government uh, yeah. and then um you know so he was in prison for one year then in 1982 he was forced into exile by the uh by the moi government right you know so and and, and then of course it, it, we as a family became uh political pawns if, if you want to put it that way because uh, the government wouldn't, wouldn't give us passports. I could get a passport. I was born in the U.S., you know, but uh, but none of my siblings or my mother could get a passport to leave, right? Um, so so as a family, we experienced, you know, that sort of the trauma. You know, sometimes we would get, um, and I think I mentioned that there's a scene like that in the book where we would get threatening phone calls. Where, you know, I I, I think it's Kalumba who makes the joke of why. <laughs> You know, like why do they like why do governments all governments make threatening phone calls with the same voice? We're gonna come and kill you, whatever, right? You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like it's always the same sort of language, right? Anyway, <laughs> yeah. So, so, so we did experience that trauma, right? You know, and it's, it's it's very very personal as well because uh, in the involvement in politics, right? Uh, in in this case, in radical politics, and becoming a part of the government. Um, you know, as kids, I remember watching. Um, you know, with my sister, you know, we would be watching effigies of, of our father being burned in the streets. You know, there there'll be government-led demonstrations against him. Um, so, so it, yeah. So, I, I I did want to capture that that when it comes to political change, there is personal sacrifice and trauma, and it's really uh, and there's a certain ugliness to it, if you will, right? You know, so for us as a family, um, just to give you a quick example, there's a time we we're having a Christmas party. This is in the eighties, you know that. that when my father had gone to exile um and um you know and the party got raided right you know by the police because there were, there were rumors that he had come back of course he hadn't uh but the police took uh information of everybody who was at the party and pretty much everybody who was at the party who was an adult didn't have jobs in a week or two right you know so so by punishing the people who ordinarily would come to your to your side or to your aid then you end up isolating that family right you know so you know you'd be walking down you know a road you know and somebody uh who 
previously was a family friend who just crossed the street, right? You know, and I, 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 and I don't blame them. I mean, it's survival, right? It's survival. And, you know, and then also the fear that comes with living under a dictatorship, right? You know, the fear that you have of constant surveillance and so on and so forth. So I definitely wanted to capture that loss, right? Um, you know, but there's a concept I like from Freud that I talk about a lot, uh, mourning and melancholy, right? You know, so in mourning, when you're mourning something, you're mourning something that you know you have lost. Uh, so it could be a parent, a country, a culture, and so on and so forth. Uh, or you could be in a state of melancholy, right? Which is, um, which is where you don't know exactly what you have lost, but you feel it, right? Mm -hmm. So in a way, for Ugam and the, and the characters in Quate, for them, they're in mourning. I mean, they had, you know, the, the people have been killed. They went to their funerals and so on and so forth. For Kalumba, he's in a, and that's why he's so tortured. He's in, a, he's in a state of melancholy, right? He knows friends are dying, uh, can go to their funerals, right? So he can, you know, the, the, the concept of mourning is that you can get over it, but he, he can't get to mourn uh, until he, until I guess he went, until he goes back to uh, to Kwate. Yeah. Speaking of mourning now, let's come to the, the Christian uh, dictate that says, when you're when an enemy slaps you on this cheek you should turn the other cheek i'm not really being cool with that you know it's just a part of the bible where i am jesus i'm like jesus you need to hold on on this particular part but you know directing it to our discussion here let's talk about forgiveness especially in the angle of of forgiving our colonizers what do you think what what are your, what are your thoughts on forgiveness you know because there are a lot of things that people have done. There's the slavery, there's the, you know, in Nigeria, amalgamating two regions that are not even supposed to be together. We are still suffering the consequences still now. So what are your thoughts on forgiveness, especially towards the, the angle of uh, colonizers? Yeah, so I don't know if you saw the story recently of, um, of the Belgian government is returning uh, Lumumba's tooth. Okay, so so yeah. first of all, it's so callous, right, you know, that that not only did they kill him, you know, and and uh, you know, and, and and chop him up and so on and so forth, and burn him in acid, right? That they also took souvenirs, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so I, 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 you know, we can talk also about um, uh, what was the name? She was taken from South Africa uh, and paraded in Europe, uh, but finally her body was returned. I, and it, yeah, Hortentot Venus, you know, um, the current quote Hortentot Venus, who was, it, this is in the 1700s or so, you know, she was taken from South Africa and really paraded uh, like in a zoo, right? Uh, but, finally, but finally her remains were returned uh, during the Mbeki era. Um, so, but really, there, I don't think there can be forgiveness unless what was stolen is brought back, right? In, in one form or another, right? Um, because the injustices that colonialism are uh, stirred up, right, or created are still there. Uh, to give you an example, I was in, a, and I, I wrote an essay about this, about it, the, 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 it's called uh, The Pitfalls of Symbolic Decolonization, if somebody wants to look it up. Uh, but in, it, I mentioned I was in Ghana in, in, in January, right? Um, and part of my trip there was also to go to look at slave castles, right? Um, and one of the ones I went to uh, is called Keta, right? Uh, it's in a small, small village town. You know, the, the castle itself is sort of decrepit, you know, because it's not very touristy, as colors as that sound. Um, and the reason I was there was because in Maya Angelou's book, uh, All Girls Children uh, Need Troubling Shoes, right? Uh, she had gone to Keta, and she, when she got to Keta, she was received as a long lost, as a long lost uh, sibling. Right, uh, because it turns out Keta is one of the villages where slaves were being taken from. Right, so it's a long story about what happens. But at any rate, um, she asked them, you know, why are they, you know, they are crying, you know, they're celebrating her and so on and so forth. And then she asked why, and she says that um, she was told by the guide that for generations they have heard of how people were taken from them. Right, how people were taken, you know, were taken from them. You know, and they never knew where they went, right? You know, so again, going to melancholy. This was a town that was in melancholy, right? Anyway, so and when I, when I went there, it was a very strange town to me as well. It's it's not like a village town that like where I come from, where you see, uh, you know, youth walking the streets. You know, people are bustling and they are happy. Well, you know, whatever. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. um, this was a very quiet, melancholic town. So then, shortly after that, I went to Bristol in in London, right? So Bristol is one of the places where um, 
the slave, it was a slave port, right? So it is a very, very wealthy town um, where in fact recently it was in the news because one of the slave traders who was, who was a big philanthropist because of all the money he had made, um, you know, his Miss Colston, his statue was toppled, was toppled and re replaced by a black. So, yeah, I think you have the story, right? Yeah. Um, so, but in Bristol, then you have to ask yourself, okay, so even if Bristol apologizes for slavery, right? But it's not attending to the conditions it created in Keta, then what's the point, right? You know, so we have toppled a statue, which is a good thing, don't get me wrong. Uh, we have toppled the statue. But what responsibility does a town like Bristol have to a town like Keta, where indeed they are both still living, as you said, they are, yeah, it's, it's, it's slavery, they're still living through one, the profits from slavery, the other one, of course, because of the theft uh, and so on and so forth, yeah. you know it was very cathartic and i think it was useful you know that sort of restorative justice if you will but um but again what's what what's the point of having a trc a commission when you're not also addressing uh issues of of poverty of inequality you know that was uh perpetuated by the apartheid by the apartheid government right in other words What's he crying about it without giving it back? <laughs> I mean, you know, and, and why and why 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 do why do we as why should we as Africans accept that, right? Uh, so, so part, yeah, and for for me, that's a form of betrayal, actually, right? You know, that the ANC could, you know, have you know have these theatrical uh, commissions, right? While at the same time uh, creating affirmative action for the for, for for the black majority population, and it's silly that you can't have. You can't have a trickle up system uh, for a majority population, right? So it needed something more redistributive, but that's not the route that it, that it took. So instead, they did the more cathartic theatrical um, forgiveness, healing stuff. Yeah. Okay. okay. So speaking, so speaking of, of um, there was uh, something you said where people have to make amends. It's not enough to make amends; they have to look for retribution for some of things they've committed. Now, let me give you an example. In my country, Nigeria, where I come from, we see uh, governments announce that, oh, past leaders, the money they stashed in a couple of countries, the countries are returning these monies. Now, when they return these monies, what happens at the end of the day is that they are relooted. So, yeah. we have, <laughs> yes, and, you know, a couple of months ago, there was a coup in Mali where mm. a five-year-old soldier had to overthrow the government and over here in Nigeria, we've had a series of uh, civil unrest. We've had a couple of coups ourselves in the 1960s. Now, the problem is this. When we are talking about forgiveness, especially to the colonizers, mm -hmm. do we, what happens when the crime is committed by our countrymen? Mm -hmm. What happens when the people who hurt us, the people who are hurting us currently, mm -hmm. are people who we share the same skin with? What do we do? In that instance, when do we get a rest? When uh, we, the colonizers are no longer white, they are now black. So what do we do in that situation? Yeah, so, I mean, that's that's a really good question as well. And you'd have to go back to, again, the, the moment of, of colonialism, you know, independence and, and the betrayal, right? Because what happened was, um, and, and this was true in Nigeria as well, I believe, um, that, um, the more radical members, right? You know, so the Kalumbas, if you will, you know, so the more the more radical members, the the, the, the members who would have said uh, that we need a redistributive uh, component, right, uh, to, to to a democracy, those who are killed off, right? And you, and and you see the same thing in South Africa as well. I mean, you know, Steve Biko, Steve Biko has said that um, he doesn't see. This was in an interview where he said that he doesn't see how, in a country built on that great inequality. Right? How, you, how you can have freedom that's not socialist by nature, right? Yeah. You know, so, so the more socialist leaning, the more socialist leaning members uh, and leaders were killed off. And you can, you can count them off. I mean, Lumumba, we mentioned Lumumba, Milka Cabral, uh, South Africa, you can add Chris Honey, you can add Ruth Fast, and so on and so forth, right? You know, so, but what that meant then was that, um, yeah, oh yeah, and same thing for the pro-democracy pro movements in the 1990s, the more radical members were exiled, you know, that's how, you know, my dad and others end up in exile. Well, for him in the 1980s, 
Um, so, so, but you, you, you'd have to go back to those moments and and realize that that the future we are living now, right, was determined uh, when and very deliberately so when the uh, when the quote unquote the more radical uh, leaders were killed off. So then it's not surprising then that um, <laughs> which is really funny actually, you know, in 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 in, a, in, a, in an African humorous way, right? You know that uh, that. <laughs> You know that the, the money that the money that has been brought back <laughs> gets stolen again. <laughs> um, but I, I do think that as we, this generation and the generations you know and, you know that are younger than us, have a duty to learn that history of betrayal, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and at the same time, understand that the sort of democracy we are, we are being fed today is not real democracy, right? I'd I, I like using the term democracy with content. We need democracy with content. We need democracy with content of a. Uh, land redistribution. I mean, take, take an example of Kenya again. Uh, the current president owns, uh, and his family, they own 565,000 acres, right? Uh, in fact, they, they used to own 500,000, and then uh, they bought 65,000 from, uh, from Lord de la Mer's grandson or, or that family, right? You know, so, so in, in fact, so they ended up buying out the colonizer, let me put it that way. So, and this is in a country where people are killing each other and fighting over land, right? So then why why should we keep supporting leaders that we know for sure structurally, right? Structurally, it's impossible for them uh, to do the things we're asking them to do. For example, then, to elect Kenyatta as president would have to say then that somehow we hope, you know, he'll, uh, you know, give back at least, let's say, 500,000 acres, <laughs> you know, and keep for himself 65 or whatever, right? You know, so so I think we really need to find new leaderships and and and, and, and we need a new politics that's grounded on our material realities. Well said. Okay, before we go into the next set of questions, I would love us to read uh, a couple of passages so yes, that sir. those who are watching us can get a feel of the book. Mm-hmm. So if do you have uh, a particular preference, we could take a couple of pages before we continue with the question. I don't know how long we have left, but uh, I would like us to read um, a couple of passages. Yeah, since we talked about mental health, let me let, let me read one where um, where um, so we might have between different page numbers, uh, yeah. but but if you if you go to the entry, it's this is uh, Kalumba's diary in exile. Uh, entry was February first, uh, and it's under the title of uh, "In the Fucking Pit of My Mind Again" or PTSD, right? Um, so it's uh, "In the Fucking Pit of My Mind." Or PTSD. In, in my book, it's around 76, page 76. Actually, we might have the same page numbers. If I'm... Yeah. They had found me so soon. I could not believe they had found me. I had been stupid. I had relaxed. What had I been thinking? That they will forget or forgive? That they don't keep late hours? The fucking bastards so close to defeat are desperate. These are the last days and they will kill and destroy all that stands between the dictator and the bottom of the ocean. I was leaving my apartment in Madison, Wisconsin. I do not know what happened. The stink of rotten eggs. Next thing, I was in an empty bathtub. I didn't know where I was. Naked, blindfolded, handcuffed to the faucet. The water started running, cold at first, but warming up. Very hot. I started yelling for help, scalding heart. Somebody grabbed the back of my head and pushed my forehead into the water until my lungs felt like they were going to explode and my face was going to peel off. The pressure was released, but before I could take in some air, my head was thrust in again. The back of my skull banged against the faucet handle. Blood filled my dreads. I was lifted to my feet, slammed against the wall, and before my arms could tear out of their sockets, I was submerged in the water. They kept banging my head against the side of the bathtub. The blood felt warm, thick, as it soaked through my dreadlocks through the blindfold and into my eyes. Darkness, a loud voice. Give us a list of names. We want a fucking list. What list? Calmness. Silence except my heavy breathing and the sound of water as I turned and twisted my body in the water. The water drained out. After it was all gone, the knob turned again and it started filling in with cold water. I had someone fumbling for matches. I had a match strike, kerosene. They were going to set me on fire. I was going to die before I got back home tobacco burning. My friend, do you want a cigarette? I don't smoke a cigarette in my mouth. You think cigarettes will kill you? 
You died today, the voice said, laughed till it broke into a smoker's cough. I puffed and started coughing, a sharp sting, several more sharp stings all over my upper body, the smell of burning flesh. The coldness was, ri the coldness was rising and rising, and I felt my skin beginning to shrivel, my lungs constricting. I heard a sound. They were adding ice to the water. The kerosene smell, it must have been a cigarette lighter. Give us the list, the calm voice said. I don't have a list. Then make one. I can't, can't you see I can't? A thin gun barrel pressed against my temple. Why did you let him die? Who? You know who? There was nothing I could do, I would have died too. They would have killed me. You killed him, you're a murderer. Don't be self-righteous. Give us the names, the voice yelled. I did not kill anybody, but you killed for freedom, the voice reasoned. I do not let people die. Do you want to die? You leave us no choice, no. Then why, then why don't you tell us what we want to know? This can all end. You can be home tomorrow evening, AFA and everything, quarter airlines. Look, we can, tell, we can tell you have been making a nice life for yourself since we last met. Do you want to give it all up? Moments of silence. I thought of Scanner. I had a click. I braced myself. And just when I thought a bullet would come crashing into my skull, the phone started ringing. You didn't stop ringing. My cell phone. Answer the fucking phone. If they hang up, it's your balls, a blow to my head, my lips opening up once again, and a salty, warm light test in my mouth. I hate the taste of my own blood. I can't take it anymore. Give them what they want. I lifted my hands and the, hands, and the handcuffs came off. I removed the blindfold and opened my eyes. I was in my bathroom. I was trembling in cold and pain. I opened the door and was blinded by the mid-afternoon sun. From a moment, I was in a hollowed out baobab tree trying to hold my stomach in place, blood draining through my fingers. Then I started making out the walls in my apartment. Where did they go? My cell phone is still ringing. Everything in, the bath in, in my bathroom is broken. I know it's all me. I look for a mirror. There's one in my bedroom. My appearance is far worse than the last time I was here. I have cigarette burns all over. The skin on my arms is split open. The skin on my forehead is all burned. I go to the fridge and remove a frozen steak and try to level the bumps and the bruises. After a while, I give up. I get dressed and walk to Hugo's bar to stay at Billy Holiday. I simply cannot find my song. Why do I keep doing this? I really, really wish I could stop what I'm doing to myself. This thing, is, it, is this what I've become? Yeah, so and, and I think that's a passage that captures his, you know, because at this point now he's his own self-torturer, right? You know, <laughs> you know. So it's it, it, he has become his PTSD is repeating his PTSD. Yeah. See, you know, when I when I had to go on the flashbacks with him, I saw what a strong man he is, and also what a stubborn and principled man he is. You know, there were some instances where I was like, hey, just just make up in make up names and just give them the list instead of of going through that. But we see, you know, at the end of the book, we get to see that this actually happened if if we were to believe judas's account of how the list came about mm. but uh, there's one thing that also struck me about the kind of man he is even if he's subconscious he kept uh insisting that people address him with his native name that's kalumba mm. he didn't want to be known as joseph at all you know mm. he kept insisting kalumba anybody he introduced himself as kalumba and stuff like that do you think it was sheer stubbornness that made him hold on to that idea of his native name or do you think that africans even those who are in diaspora have this attachment for their native names or their identity yeah so i, I think what happens for most of us is it's, it's, it's okay again i'm thinking of several things here but um what happens for most of us is you know we live you know we live in Af african countries right having taken for granted let's say our names and language and so on and so forth and taking pride with in our english and i'm thinking of the of the scene in we need new names where um <laughs> <laughs> you know what i'm talking about where, you know, where, where the aunt is on the phone and she's trying to buy a bra you know but i think this is in michigan right you know the, the salesperson cannot understand uh, her english so she eventually she has to spell it out right then so so anyway we come with our english <laughs> you know and then you go to a store to buy something you know and um, and the question you'll always get is, uh, I'm sorry, I don't understand you, or where are you from, and so on and so forth, right? So our Queen's English, as we say, uh, then is, is put under under question and constantly our identity. Then then we have to reach for something that you know that that's ours, if you will, right? You know. So and the first thing is your name, right? You know. So you know he has an accent. You know the idea of always being questioned. You know. Then 
um, Kalumba becomes, calling himself Kalumba becomes a way of, of asserting his identity. Um, but you know, so you know, so I, I teach, right? Uh, and some of the students who take my classes are first generation uh, Africans in, in in the U.S. or second generation, and part of their struggle is that their parents probably, or more often than not, uh, did not teach them their language, right? Uh, you know, and at the same time, uh, isolate them from African Americans. So they really do have real identity issues because who are they right you know and then of course for most parents it's also very expensive you know to keep going back and forth uh to nigeria or kenya or south africa or wherever right um so so you and so there's this generation that's growing up without a real sense of who they are there was a time um this is a few years ago when my father and i were invited to go to seattle right uh by the kenyan youth association there and the reason they invited us was to go and yeah and talk about identity and language and so on and so forth because we're saying there are generation in limbo right and most of them either are dropping out of college or doing drugs and so on and so forth uh and and that was one of the most eye-opening you know you know because for me i grew up in kenya right you know so i grew up in kenya i left when i was 19. Uh, I'm, I'm i'm political I, I read and so on and so forth um so i'm, I'm fairly conscious of, of my background right but for some of these kids you know, they are born in the US, right? You know, and they don't have a, a larger cultural consciousness to fall back on, right? Yeah, so yeah, so yeah, so yeah, so for Kalumba, yeah, it, 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 it became very important for him to just say I'm Kalumba. But speaking of, let's let's use you now, Mukoma. You know, do you have, I know your father uh, is a nationalist and your own name, you stick into your uh, Kenyan name. First of all, do you have an English name? And, okay, or, yes. Yeah, no, that's a, yeah, so I actually meant to mention that. So when I was growing up, I, yeah, we, we were never given Christian names, you know, so I grew up as Mukoma. Um, but for many, many years, sometimes even today it still happens, right? But for many years when I was growing up and my first years in the U.S., the question was always, what's your Christian name? Mm -hmm. Right? So, and for many years, I was the one who was always the odd one out. But I, but I think that's changing now, right? I, think, I actually think that has completely changed where, you know, now your name is just your name. Yeah, but I had to justify. I'm, I'm the one... I'm, I, who was named uh, after my grandfather, <laughs> you know, I actually after, after my great grandfather, I, who was named after my great grandfather, I'm the one who would have to justify why I don't have a why I don't have an English name. It, and if you think of the callousness of, of 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 colonialism, right? Not only the whole idea that we are going to name you after ourselves, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but with that said, there is this book called um, "Women's of Brewster's Place." Um, I forget the author now. It's been a while since I read it. But there's one there's one scene that stuck with me where um where one of the characters uh had kept uh her quote unquote her slave name, right? So let's say she was called Mary, I don't remember her name. And her, her, her and her, her idea was why should I change this name when it's also the name that you know my grandmother and great grandmother it's it's the name they used to fight for our freedom, right? So there's that there's that there's that other side of the world, you know, Nelson Mandela. You know, or Steve Biko, right? You know, um, you know, you, you really can't criticize them for, <laughs> you know, for, for keeping Steve as well. Yeah. Okay. Um. Another thing is, let's talk about uh, Kalumba, where despite the fact that he was in exile for ten years and he got happiness towards the last year before he came back, there was always this nostalgia. And I want to ask you, as a person, not necessarily about the character. Do you? I know you've been in the U.S. for a very long time, and you come from this kind of political background where your father has been through so much, your family has been through so much. But now you live in the U.S. That's your reality. You live there with your family. That's your final bus stop, like we say in Nigeria. <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever get nostalgic that like, oh, if things were different, I would have you know made Kenya my base? Do you ever have those kind of feelings? Yeah, certainly. I, you know, and, and and that comes out in poetry. Oh, by the way, I should mention also my father changed his name, right, from James Goge to Goge Wadiyong, right, for, for the same reasons. But um, yeah, but 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 certainly, I mean, you know, so I do explore that in poetry. You know, and there are times when I would have this feeling of that um, that there's still a me in Kenya, right? You know, they, you know, growing up, you know, with friends, you know, and you know, growing up in my home area or whatever. Maybe I'd have gone to Nairobi, you know. Um, so, and I do have poetry that explores that, like what it, actually it's, it's one of the poems might be in Mrs. Shaw, you know, but, but then, yeah, so there's always that weird question of, okay, what if I run into myself, right? 
what if I ran into the Kenyan me? <laughs> like, how, how, how would that work out? Um, but suddenly, part of the price then, you know, that I think we as a family had to pay is that we, we left and we had to grow roots where we are because you can't, you know, I've met, I've met uh, quite a number of people who are always trying to go back, right? And some of them do successfully go back. So, you know, but there are some who always say, you know, they're trying to go back and that prevents them then from growing roots where they are. Um, so, but I, but yeah, but I, I really do believe where you are, that's where you grow roots and that's where you fight from, right? Um, so, because if, I, if, I, if I'm always thinking about or looking into Kenya, then that means I'm not worried about issues of racial injustice in the US or economic injustice here, right? Um, but suddenly, suddenly that loss is there. Like, oh, yeah, and I, and I feel it when I go up to Kenya and, um, you know, and I'm hanging out with my brothers, you know, of course we are going out to eat roast meat, you know, mm -hmm. and we're hanging out, but usually we hang out with their friends, right? You know, cause I, I don't have, a, I, my friends in Kenya, we don't have that sort of close relationship anymore. You know, sometimes I'm just sitting there, you know, sipping my beer and wondering, damn, this would have been nice. It would be nice to grow old with people you have known all your life, right? Um, yeah, so there, so there is that. I mean, there, there's certainly that loss. Um, though now, because of technology, you know, for example, yesterday I was talking to my brother in Kenya, right? Um, then I'm able to go back once or twice a year, well, until COVID. <laughs> in fact, this time I was supposed to be in Kenya. But, uh, yeah, so, but I, but I do believe you grow roots where you are and you fight from there. Yeah. Okay, um, let's talk about uh, roots now, displacement. I know one of the talking points against the Obama administration when he, before he became president, was that he, he was the son of a, he was a Kenyan, he wasn't really an American. Yeah. Uh, do you think, uh, let's, I'm turning this question back to you now. Where, do you ever have this feeling of displacement where you don't really fit in in the US, you don't really fit in Kenya, so you are just existing in the limbo based on things that have your, you know, immigration quite early. Do you ever feel not here, not there? You're not really, people don't really see you as an American. People don't really see you as a Kenyan. You're just floating in the middle. Did you ever have such feelings? Yes, it's, uh, certainly. Yeah, and it's, it's uh, something that there's, a, there's an essay I wrote um, for the Guardian called, you know, Am I African or, or Black American or something, or some, or somewhere between Black and African. In fact, the book I'm writing now is actually pretty much exploring that issue, right? So the book is called, uh, somewhere between black and African, a biography of my skin. So it's it's, it's something that I constantly think about. Um, but at some point, at, but at some point, this is the early 2000s. I was like, you know, like who says you can only have one home, right? It, culturally, it's ecologically, and so on and so forth. Like who, like who, who, who decided that you can only have one identity, right? And so and once I asked myself that question, I was like, hey, well, shit, you know, I, <laughs> you know, I'm gonna claim all the homes I can, right? You know. Because you, 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 have, you have to give yourself that mental freedom in, in order for you to do the work you want to do, right? So I would say I, I did free myself from that question by saying that I don't know who exactly, you know, say that you can only have one home or an identity, but um, but that's, that's, that's not my fight, right? You know, I'm just going to claim all my homes and, uh, and, and, I'll, and I'll fight from, from, from those spaces, right? You know, so again, you know, in the U.S., I'm very concerned about racial injustice. In Kenya, I'm concerned about the... I don't know the new, quote unquote, the neocolonial colonial legacy or the meaning of our democracy, yeah. uh, and so on and so forth. So I, I say let's let we claim we, we claim our homes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, sounds good. Yeah. So, and, and, okay, you want to say something? Yeah, and, and also the, that I, I think the same questions we face in the US might be more intense, but uh, but isn't it the same thing when somebody leaves their village, you know, their village town and moves to let's say Lagos, right? Mm -hmm. They spend 10, 15 years there, right? And then when they go back, are they, you know, it's, it's almost like they're also foreigners, right? Yeah. Yeah. Very true. Sometimes when I even travel to the village, they're like, ah, can you speak people very well? Can you do this very well? I'm like, who says you can't have two homes? I'm going to give them this your answer and tell them who says you can't have two homes. <laughs> Anyways, um, towards the ending, there was something I noticed about the book. You made uh, Kalumba's return to Kwati Republic. You made it very anticlimactic. You know, he got to the airport. I was expecting a fanfare, like red carpet, the feeling of, mm, you know, it was worth it at the end of the day. But you made the end, you made the reunion, you know, with Sukena, with Ogumi, you made it very anticlimactic. 
Mm. Yeah, even though later, much later, there were parties and stuff like that. But that particular place where he landed from the plane and he just had to meet everybody all over again, there wasn't really anything that was, uh, you know, worthy about that moment. So I want to ask you, why, why did you make it that way? Were you trying to pass a message that all revolutions don't end the way we envisage it to be, or was there any other statement you wanted to make with that kind of reunion? Yeah, I, I want. I, I think wanted to keep it. Um, so, to keep it, to, for lack of a better, to keep it real, right? Because at that point, politically, they don't. You know, they used to be friends, but then they have ten years or so between them, right? Um, you know, essentially they have grown apart. But also, more importantly, ideologically, they know they are not. Uh, in other words, they're no longer comrades ideologically. So, but it, yeah, and, and you know, in the past few years, when I would go back to Kenya, not to compare myself to Kalumba, um, I mean, you get that feeling, you know, um, you know, that let's say I would arrange to meet my high school friends, you know, but then, you know, like, <laughs> you know, you have just, you know, you have grown different lives and, um, you know, and unless you work hard and find uh, and, and rework your friendship, right? But then if you, if you say you're going to rework your friendship, you know, you're living in two weeks or so. But anyway, so, so but for him, it's, I think it's a political reality. The, the, the one time when he feels now uh, that he's back home is through the bathing ceremony, right? And this is something that used to happen, actually, amongst the Gekoyo, that uh, if he had gone away, you'd come back and, and be reborn, if you will, right? As a way of coming back. So, so, so that ceremony, you know, where then he's where it, it's as if he's been coming out from his grandmother's womb, right, yeah. all over again. Uh, okay, not all over again, of course, but you know what I mean. Um, yeah, yeah I, I think that's when finally that ceremony helps him, um, you know, yeah, feel back at home, except for the political reality that then eventually will, uh, will destroy him. You know, so it's, I don't know, a part of it is, you know, I mean, how we live our lives, really, right? For, for example, with um, moments of hope uh, that then crash against the reality of the real political material conditions on the ground. Uh, for example, Obama's election, right? It was a moment of hope. But really, even then, in 2006 or two, whatever, right, you could tell that the political reality of the U.S. Uh, would defeat most of the things he, 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 was, he, was, he was hoping to achieve in the same way that uh, if you're talking about a election, a democracy election in Nigeria or Kenya and so on and so forth, moments of hope that for sure you know when you run them against the grain of the real uh, historical material conditions on the ground, they'll fail, right? Yeah, yeah. So I, I don't know, it's, it's, it's a tragedy though. Though I do hope in the end, uh, it's Sukena and Melissa who are left standing, right? You know, So there's that glimmer of hope, right? That the revolution will continue. Aluta continue. With women who have no place in history, are you sure there'll be a part two? <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's something I want to read uh, your dedication because I'm a dedication freak. When I get a book, the first thing I read is the dedication, not acknowledgement, dedication. I want to, I'm usually fascinated with uh, the reason why people uh, write their books. So you said um, your dedication here reads, we discussed dedication to Thomas Sankara, Ruth First, and Morris Bishop, who died so we may live only to be betrayed again and again. Mm -hmm. Now, when the final scene, when uh, Kalumba, no spoilers, but you know what happened in the final scene where Melissa mm -hmm. and Sukuna were watching what was happening at the airport, the airport TV, and Kalumba was saying that, oh, this was where everything ended. You know, this dedication came back to me. I was like, so is this guy that, you know, that did this thing? <laughs> I was like, no, 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 no. So that, that betrayal, you know, although towards the end, I was like, hmm, this thing is beginning to look like a Nigerian film. But let, let me give we'll my benefit of doubt. Well, you still did the whole Nigerian film ish. So yeah. why did you put that? betrayal mm -hmm. there to just shock us especially as this betrayal yeah. reflected in your dedication yeah actually now i'm kind of shocked by how um by how pessimistic it is <laughs> <laughs> but um you know but but it's, it's also the reality of it you know and 
so so there are several things here one i wanted to capture um and the book hopefully does that the the personal nature of this betrayal right so thomas sankara was betrayed by his friend right you know they they fought together you know or rather they did the coup together you know and struggle for Burkina Faso together uh Comprare, right in fact i don't know if this is true but part of the mythology is that when uh, when Comprare did the coup and he went to uh sankara's house and Sankara, you know, and he pulled a gun on Sankara that Sankara laughed and thought it was a joke, right? Mm -hmm. uh, same thing with Maurice Bishop. Maurice B Bishop uh, again was betrayed. Wow. And on yeah. And on. Yeah. So, but and, and Ruth, 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 Ruth wasn't betrayed by a personal friend, but she ended up being killed by a parcel bomb, you know, sent to her house, I believe in Mozambique, uh, by the apartheid government. So, and I don't know, for, for me, what is painful about our history is that we have had this really beautiful, revolutionary, dedicated people to the African cause, right? That over and over again get killed, right? Uh, in, 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 in politically, of course, right? You know, but then also the personal nature of, of it all, right? Which is, to me, that's, I, I, I think it, yeah, and also, yeah, it also uh, Lumumba and Mobutu, right? You know, there's always this, uh, <laughs> like, very personal nature to it. Yeah. Uh, that to me, ultimately, that's where, it, that's ultimately heartbreaking. Um, yeah, but if we counted, if we counted all the people we have lost who really, you know, Thomas Sankara, when it comes to women issues, you know, he was, he's the one who said something to the effect that, uh, you know, that, I don't know, he, he called patriarchy backwards, right? He, he didn't miss any words, right? Uh, you know, and argued you cannot have a, 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 a true revolution if indeed, um, if indeed half your population is in chains, right? Mm -hmm. So this really forward-looking people that over and over again, when you look at our history, even starting with the you know, struggles against slavery and so on and so forth, over and over again, these beautiful people uh, then getting assassinated and killed. And yeah, yeah. Um, but, but at the heart of it all, though, there is this quote from, uh, from uh, Che Guevara where he says, a revolutionary is first moved by love, right? Mm -hmm. So, and I think for all these people, Maurice, Maurice Bishop, uh, Thomas Sankara, uh, Ruth first and so on and so forth, that they were, first, they, were, they were moved by love first and foremost. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Mukoma. Before we round up, do you have any last words for us, for the viewers? Tell us something quite quickly. We have like five minutes left. Just, you know, last word, give us a shout out, as we call it in Nigeria. Oh, well, <laughs> well first, I mean, you know, I, I, I really feel, um, I feel the loss of not being Like we would have met up, you know, um, but then also that for writers, you know, like what we enjoy the most, I think, ultimately is um, is the hanging out, you know, I'd have like going to um, uh, to the shrine, for example, I wouldn't have mind returning to the shrine. <laughs> yeah, but I, but I, I do want to say that I, I like where um, our African literary ecosystem, where it's going, right? We have Cassava, we have Sin City, we have uh, Ake, we have Brito Paper, we have you know, Lolwe, you know, we have uh, Chimurenga, right? You know, so in a, in a way, I do think we're in a position where now we can we can have our own ecosystem where one doesn't necessarily have to be published in the West, right? You know, for example, oh yeah, maybe I should talk about that because it, it, it was very, very meaningful for me that uh, that we had this card that was first published in the U.S. Um, that was first published in the U.S. In, I believe in, I don't know, 2013 or thereabouts didn't have a publisher until Zukiswa came, you know, read the book and she said, didn't have an African publisher, right? Until Zukiswa read the book and said, oh, this would be great for Paivapo, right? Um, in a way, I should add then that that we this card, or Mrs. Shaw, as it's, it's called in the US, it was also in exile until it was welcomed uh, into the African literary ecosystem. So I, I, if there's one thing that, I, that I'm very optimistic about, uh, is the work we, we are all doing, you know, even my work with the my Mabati Kiswahili Prize, uh, the Mabati Cornell Kiswahili Prize for writing in Kiswahili, right? You know, so that, yeah, so I'm, I'm glad we are, we, are, we are creating our own ecosystem so we don't rely on Western publishers and so on and so forth, who then define what raises to the top. Yeah, and on that note, we'll be calling it a day. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Mukoma. Thank you for everyone. This is still a K Arts and Book Festival. Uh, we just finished the book charts with Mukoma Wangugi. Make sure you get the book with the scarred. Uh, it's called uh, Mrs. Shaw in the West. 
and then it's called We the Sun <laughs> <laughs> in Africa. Um, on that note, we call it a day. This is still Aki Arts and Book Festival. Sino Suchiko signing out. place to go you can join me in the world of words when it seems like i'm nowhere to be found if you look you'll find me in a book let's take a ride to the past in the back of a phoenix let's flow around the moon you'll never be alone now you know where Find me, find you, find the world in a book Never be alone, now you know where to look Find me, find you, find the world in a book We don't just think of ourselves as a bank uh, we think of ourselves as corporate citizen with responsibility for growing the economy reading and education is a key part of it but equally important is having access to reading materials uh, at home a lot of the intervention we've done throughout this covid is to ensure that people can safely navigate the uncertainties of the COVID crisis and come out of it ready for, you know, to leave again. Let's take a ride to the past in the back of a phoenix, let's flow around the moon. The dreams that we have are limited by what we have directly interacted with. What reading does is it makes it possible for you to begin to live in worlds that don't yet exist. One read creates a discipline of reading. One read puts me on a timeline. It gives me an important book and I have an opportunity to read it and to collaborate. It's almost like having someone who does your book selection for you. If you have editors and people who are really good at this saying to you, this is the book for the month, I, I value that. I want to be able to read in a community. I want reading to be a collaborative thing. I want reading to be a communing and one read allows me to do that. I will use one read any day, any time. Stranger's Guide is not a typical American travel magazine. Our mission is to dive deep into a single location, commissioning work from great writers and photographers famous individuals, as well as up-and-coming new voices. This year, we decided to go to Lagos. And we are proud of the volume we produced, with original work from some of Nigeria's best writers and photographers, working with luminaries like Wale Soinka, Molara Wood, and Femi Kute. We think this is a very special volume, and we're so excited to bring it back to Lagos. Visit myspectre.com to get your Spectre experience. Spectre. Loans in five minutes.